My name is Tyler, and this is Steven, and today we are talking about build packs. So what are build packs? Um, I think some of us are familiar with this scenario. Developer creates an application, runs a CF push. Maybe this is a Ruby app. Our build pack is going to run, install Ruby, install a version of Ruby, and we're going to get a running application on Cloud Foundry. Pretty simple. Well, we on the build packs team, we love build packs. We love this model. There are a lot of reasons that we really love this. Um, uh, first of all, build packs are an opinionated build. Uh, this means we get this really nice, consistent application environment structure across the organization. Our apps look the same. Um, because of this nice consistency, security is a really uh, primary concern as a part of the build pack model. Um, this model allows us to easily roll and update our applications quickly. And we also don't feel limited by this model. We still have flexibility. We can still use all of our favorite languages, tools, frameworks. Um, and of course, we're always trying to help the operators, empower operators, and allow developers to develop. So thinking about this, let's take a look at an alternative to build packs. Um, a uh, really popular alternative uh, in the application build is the Dockerfile model. There are a lot of good things about Dockerfiles. Dockerfiles are um, really flexible. It's really easy to add dependencies, change up your application image. Um, these Dockerfiles create container images. There's a lot of great things about those. They, container images come with immutable container layers, so we know that the code that we are testing against is the same code that we are deploying. Um, it's also a straightforward model, pretty easy to pick up, and we also can easily tell what's going inside these Docker files. We're writing it out line by line. But it's not all good. Um, some of the issues with this model comes up um, when, specifically when we're creating app images, and also a lot in the enterprise world. Um, because um, we're creating app images. The dependencies in our environments are locked behind other Docker files because we are using Docker files on top of Docker files and layers on top of layers. So if we want to patch a dependency at the bottom layer, we need to rebuild layers on top of those. Um, Docker files are so flexible that it's pretty hard to create a consistent structure across the organization for these apps. Um, and because of that inconsistency, it is harder to keep those secure and update all those dependencies. Um, again, because of that inconsistency, it's harder for operators to control the contents of all the apps across their organization, and therefore harder for them to audit those apps. So let's take a look at what this might look like. Here is a pretty typical Docker file application, based application. Um, we're going to be starting at the OS level, um, the OS layer at the, at the bottom where we are installing any OS level packages, maybe OpenSSL, maybe like a MySQL connector if we want to use that. And then our next, level, our next layer is going to install Node.js. Uh, let's say we're using a Node app here. Um, we're going to install Node.js. We're going to pull from that previous Docker file. And finally, on the top layer, we're going to install our app, run npm install. We have our running application, a nice Node app. Well, what happens when we give the developers a little bit of flexibility here? Um, let's say the developer, developers are all managing their own application images. So everyone is going to choose their own base image for their app. They're going to choose their favorite operating system. They're going to pick the packages that they want. And then maybe everyone is installing their, their Node layer as well, differently as well. Maybe they're installing different versions of Node. And finally, they're installing their apps on top of that. So we've got a lot of, a lot of divergence here already. But what happens when we look org-wide? Org we've got lots of applications running. Well, now we have chaos. And we have lots of different uh, applications on top of node layers, on top of OS packages. Well, what happens when an OS-level CVE comes in? OpenSSL has a critical CVE. We need to patch this right away. Well, in this scenario, an operator could rebuild that OS image, image layer, but it's more likely that that operator is going to wait for the downstream package to get updated, and it'll pull that one in. 
Um, so after it updates the OS layer, it's going to have to update each individual Node.js layer. And finally, the developer can rebuild their apps on top of those layers, test all of those, redeploy them. Um, and this scenario may take um, something maybe like months, but in reality, it may never get patched across the org. Um, maybe we're not doing it exactly this um, inconsistently. Maybe we're doing Docker files a little bit more the right way, where we have a consistent organization image for the OS layer and the Node.js layer. We are using good practice and making sure all teams are using the same OS, the same version of Node, and they're building their apps on top of that. Well, CV comes in. Um, operators are going to wait for downstream to build that one OS level image, rebuild the Node.js image, and then all the apps on top of that. This scenario is better but still not great. Maybe this gets rolled, depending on how long these builds take, and the testing, and the redeploying. Maybe this takes a few days, maybe longer. So let's take a look at the build pack model. On Cloud Foundry, we start with our staging container, which contains a build pack. We are going to stream in our application, our developer application. The build pack is going to inspect the app, figure out what dependencies it needs. Using this Node.js example, we're going to install Node. We're going to run npm install, get the npm packages. We're going to tar up that, those layers into what's called a droplet, export that out of the staging container. And next, we are going to provision the, the desired number of running containers. And those, running, those launch containers are going to contain uh, packages supplied by the platform rootfs. Um, the droplet is going to get streamed into the launch containers. The platform will invoke the start command, and we have our running apps. So we can easily tell that with this build pack, we are able to take care of the inconsistencies that arise from the Dockerfile model, take care of the Node.js level, take care of the operating system level. So, switch here. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Cloud Foundry has a really interesting way of dealing with. Uh, vulnerabilities when they occur in operating system packages. Uh, and it sort of ties into the infrastructure for how Cloud Foundry is, you know, runs on top of VMs. So this is a, a Diego cell. And you can see it has uh, multiple apps on it. Uh, they could be different droplets. They could be the same. Uh, and it has operating system packages uh, for the containers, uh, for the, the stack, which is like the container rootfs. And ha it has operating system packages uh, for the VM to run the Diego to sort of support the Diego components themselves as they run. So when a vulnerability hits, uh, you have a whole bunch of Diego cells, and they have some vulnerability in them in the, the operating system layers. And to patch this, the platform sort of one by one starts a new Diego cell with a duplicate apps from one of the old, outdated Diego cells that has new, where the new cell has new operating system packages, both for the stack, the container rootfs, and the stem cell, the, the VM. And then it takes the old cell down. And so it kind of runs through each cell and brings new cells up and takes old cells down until the whole platform is patched. And this is kind of really nice in Cloud Foundry because it lets us kind of take advantage of the way the infrastructure looks in order to patch security vulnerabilities and in, in operating system packages sort of live in production for a very large platform in a couple of hours. It's sort of very consistent. And of course, we only do this for the operating system packages uh, that have that sort of ABI compatibility contract and only with operating system packages that are uh, patched by upstream vendors in sort of safe ways. Uh, so it's, we've never had a report of this causing problems <laughs> where app behavior changes in an undesirable way. So that's a sort of pretty exciting advantage of build packs that people don't think about too much. So again, uh, you know, as Tyler said, we like build packs because they're opinionated, they're secure, you have you know, nice security benefits, they provide a lot of different languages, they provide a lot of operator control, which is really important, they make developers' lives easier. Uh, but there are problems too. So uh, this sort of droplet model involves a lot of data transfer that's probably not necessary. We build droplets, and then we transfer the same droplets to the you know, Diego VMs uh, you know, many times but when we don't really need to necessarily. Uh, we rebuild a lot of stuff every time, even if we don't need to, uh, in that sort of simple build pack model where we're building a brand new droplet on each rebuild. And there's, there's some caching, but it's pretty inefficient. It's, it's sort of a, a simple form of caching we have right now. So we've been working on a new build pack contract along with uh, Heroku. It's sort of a, this is like a, a collaborative engineering effort where we have contributions from Pivotal and Heroku. 
Um, it's uh, called Cloud Native Build Packs. It actually just entered the CNCF last week. Uh, it's a really exciting thing. Um, the, this new contract uh, has some really key changes over the previous one. It's sort of a complete breakaway from what we had before. Uh, it creates portable OCI images. Uh, it uses separate build and run uh, images, so you can have you know compilers and stuff on one image, but not have that in your final container. Uh, the detection process gets a lot more advanced. So detection involves uh, you know looking through the application and figuring out what dependencies need to get supplied and creating a plan for the build ahead of time, which has a lot of benefits. It also kind of serves as a, a bill of materials for the container afterwards. Uh, the uh, it has build pack groups that allow for multi-detection, so we can pick a bunch of different build packs that apply to your app without you having to think about that ahead of time. And we can break the build packs down into really small pieces that just do, you know, instead of a node build pack, we're going to have a NPM build pack and a Yarn build pack and a node build pack and then individual build packs for different, um, you know, partners or, or extensions that you might want to your app. Uh, and I think most importantly, this, le this leverages uh, some really kind of new features of the OCI image format um, and new features of Docker registries uh, to really efficiently update just individual layers on a registry that need to get updated. We don't, we don't have to, uh, you know, rebuild lower layers in order to rebuild higher layers <laughs> with, with OCI, which is something not many people know about. And I'll talk more about those uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So let's take a look at some of these changes a little bit more in depth. So if you remember the droplet that we were creating during staging before, we've gotten rid of that. We're using OCI images. There's a lot of really nice benefits to this. Right off the bat, we get a um, uh, layer digest for each of the different layers. And this is you know, contractually associated with the contents of each layer. So we can easily audit our applications, make sure things haven't changed. Um, not only that, the OCI images are very portable. We can run these images on all over the place, a lot of different places. Um, it really makes it nice to abstract that. Um, so let's take a look at the actual change of the implementation of build packs. So on the left, you'll see the old build pack interface. This is how we used to develop build packs. We would have four separate executables. These would all run in order. Um, and we've reduced that down to two. We think that we don't need this extra complication, and we hope that this simplification makes it easier for people to write their own custom build packs. Um, not only that, but another, another interesting part is that previously the detection script was usually generally a pretty minimal step that would s return zero or one, depending on whether um, the build pack should be used for the application. Well, now, the detection is going to do have a little bit more responsibility. It's going to reach into that app and figure out a build plan for the subsequent steps to run um, based on those contents of the app. And we'll see that come up more. So because of this change, we um, are able to create a new way of doing multiple build packs. Um, so uh, we have this new concept for multiple build packs called a build pack group. And this is going to be how a lot of build packs are kind of thought of in the new API. Um, so let's take an example of a Ruby and Node.js app. Pretty common scenario. So we've got our build pack group, which we have defined as a Ruby build pack and a Node build pack. We have our application code. Um, first thing that's going to happen during staging is the detection script is going to inspect the application code. It's going to say, OK, great. This is a Ruby app. You should use this build pack. I'm going to return 0. I'm also going to contribute a build plan. I think we need to contribute a Ruby version. Um, and maybe I might provide metadata along with that for the build steps as well. We're going to move on now to the next build pack in the group. This build pack says, yes, this is also a Node.js build pack, our application. So we are going to return 0. And I'm also going to tr contribute to the same build plan and let you know what versions of Node what, um, I also want to contribute to this uh, app environment. So after that, the build different, uh, the, we're going to go back to the Ruby build pack, which is going to run its build step. It's going to read from this build plan. It's going to create a Ruby layer, because it knows it needs a version of Ruby. It's going to run bundle install. The text script probably told it to do that. Um, and then we're going to move over to the Node.js build pack. It's going to read from the build plan during build. 
create the Node.js layer, run npm install, get some Node modules. So one of the things that's really nice about this change is that we're finding that making these build packs really modular is a really powerful thing um, because we are able to reduce the dependencies, the dependencies that we need only to the applications that really need them. We're able to reduce a bit of uh, resource usage there. So in this example, we thought initially that the Node.js build pack would be just a single build pack, but really we're finding it's better uh, implemented as separate build packs, where the Node.js build pack provides just Node, and the NPM build pack, its detect script tells the um, build process whether it should actually install NPM not modules. So you could imagine that there's an application that only needed Node, didn't need modules, and we were able to modularize like this. A really good example of this is the Java build pack. And the Java build pack team is working on splitting the Java build pack into a lot of separate build packs. Thanks. So I want to go into a little more detail about how this works, and specifically um, how, how we make rebuilds really efficient uh, using the new model. Uh, so uh, I, I think the sort of key idea behind it is that we only rebuild and upload layers when it's necessary. And that includes uploading layers all the way to the edge. So we, we just update, you know, rebuild a few layers that we need to locally uh, or you know, on your CI system or on a platform. And then those individual layers get transferred through Docker registries and Docker daemons all the way out to the, the you know, cell or, or, or whatever you could run on a Kubernetes, your Kubernetes um, deployment. Uh, out, out at the very end. So uh, the, to do this, we use some interesting features of the OCI image specification. So the OCI image specification breaks uh, layers. It's, it's sort of a, a departure from the Docker v1 image specification, where now instead of linked layers that point to each other, you have individual content addressable layers for the file system. And you can apply those in an order, but they're not, they're not, it's not like Git anymore. They're not linked together. So we can, we can rebuild those layers, uh, whatever layers we want to replace, and just update the individual ones in the image um, and just send those up to the, the registry. So uh, another feature we take advantage of is a new feature in um, modern Docker registries and, and this sort of Docker v2 registry, where it's a feature called cross-repository blob mounting. So we can have uh, one image repo that's a source of uh, the root FS for lots of other image repos. And then without any data transfer, really, or without sort of the negligible amount of data transfer, we can point you know, 1,000 image repos at a new base image uh, just by going across each image and making a small metadata change. And so this would let you update. This would kind of take the Cloud Foundry model where we have the cells and we're rolling them and replay that on top of a Docker registry to get sort of the same benefits. Uh, that's, that's one of the sort of coolest things about this, I think. So the, re the result of sort of using these two strategies together is that we get really fast builds a really minimal data transfer, uh, and we can, we can do the sort of layer rebasing thing directly on the registry. Uh, and so, so he, he, I'll kind of go through and compare these, these two ways of doing things a little more technically. So uh, before we had um, you know, just this supply and finalize build step, and so you have your uh, you know, application, and it runs supply finalize, does everything, and generates a droplet. And when you want to rebuild again, you know, yes, there's a small cache it has access to that where it can you know, recover some of the things it downloaded last time, but it's basically going to do all the same things and generate a new droplet and transfer all those same droplet bits out to the edge. Where in the new model, we take those two steps, that sort of detect step and that supply and finalize step, and we combine that supply and finalize step into one, and then we introduce two more steps that uh, the platform is responsible for called analysis and export. And so. Detect selects the build packs that should run and figures out what dependencies the application needs. Uh, analysis sort of grabs information about uh, the uh, previous image. Build uses that information to determine what layers to rebuild, and export sends those layers up to the registry. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So to kind of break this down really granularly, in the analyze step, we pull information from the image configuration, which is a special sort of easy to access section in a, re in a Docker image in a registry. Uh, and we write that into TOML files that each build pack can read. And so you'll see in the build step, they can modify those TOML files. And those TOML files represent the contents of the image layers. Uh, so in the first step here, we pull them from the, the remote image. In the build step, uh, the build packs read the, those TOML files to determine the contents of the existing layers and decide which layers to regenerate. And they just regenerate them by creating a directory with the new contents of the file system. It's very simple. 
Uh, and they also still have access to a small transparent cache. Uh, it's a, it's a, it has a little bit fewer guarantees than the cache in, in Cloud Foundry right now. Um, you know, it may go away, uh, but it, it, it can also be used to you know, cache things that you need to download for build, uh, for instance. Uh, and then so you end up with your new layers and your compiled app. Uh, and then in the export step, we re-upload the uh, new, newly created directories as layers to replace the previous ones. We leave other layers alone. Uh, and then we combine all those TOML files together into a big JSON blob and put that back on an image label to live in the image configuration so that on the next analysis step, it can be recovered and you know, it sort of works like that. Um, so to kind of give you an example of this, to break it down into what this looks like on uh, first build and second build, uh, you, have your, you have your app on your first build. Analysis doesn't do anything yet because there's no image there. Build generates these, uh, you know, Ruby and no or downloads Ruby and Node and installs them, installs Node modules, installs Ruby gems, export, uploads all those layers. And then in the second build, uh, uh, if, you know, just parts of that are updated, just say package JSON changes and your gem file changes, uh, we read information about the previous layers. We decide, oh, we're going to rebuild uh, the Node modules and, and uh, gems. We just up the, update those individual layers and the app layer on the registry, and everything else stays where it is, and we don't have to, to regenerate it. Uh, and that's sort of the process. So the, the goals here are increased portability from what Cloud Foundry is. We don't have droplets anymore, which are kind of a Cloud Foundry-specific thing. We have OCI images, which will run anywhere. Uh, we kind of decouple that build process from Cloud Foundry, so you can run it anywhere. Uh, it's sort of a more flexible model. You have uh, m lots of smaller build packs that are simpler and easier to understand and more transparent. Um, and we can really reduce the build time and the data transfer, where some builds are now milliseconds, where before they were 30 seconds. That's really, it's been a, a kind of impressive thing to see. Uh, so if you want more information, the CNCF project uh, is at buildpacks.io. Um, just to clarify a little bit, the CNCF project has the infrastructure and tools and specification for build packs now, uh, but the Cloud Foundry build packs are still part of Cloud Foundry, and they'll, they'll be that way uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and that's all we got. Thanks. Anybody have questions? Uh, so, uh, the, the so we, we worked on this effort along with Heroku. It's sort of a collaborative engineering effort. Um, the uh, I infrastructure and tools, the, like, we have a CLI now that will build build packs into uh, OCI images. We have a formal specification for it. Uh, all, all that's part of the CNCF project. But the Cloud Foundry build packs are you know, going to continue to be part of Cloud Foundry and the Cloud Foundry Foundation. The Heroku build packs are going to continue to be part of, you know, owned by Heroku and, and their in our respective places. So, so the question is, if I build uh, CNCF button, which button will you choose in terms of Cloud Foundry? Uh, so you're asking about compatibility. So if you build new v3 build packs on the, with the CNCF spec, will they run on Cloud Foundry? So they won't run on Cloud Foundry right now. Uh, we have a bunch of different options for enabling that. I think the simplest thing that we plan to do really soon is make a wrapper uh, that you can just run on a v3 build pack and make it run in, actually run on a group of v3 build packs, and it would create a Cloud Foundry style build pack for you. That's until Cloud Foundry has you know, native v3 support. And there, there, there's compatibility in other directions, too, that we, we've, we've been thinking about for uh, you know, making v2 build packs run on v3 things. And that's it's a kind of complicated thing. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Uh, you mentioned that you can use or like, change Docker base images, like uh, the Ubuntu base image. Uh, I was wondering that that sounds awfully like a git rebase for the developers in here. And how would you, how would you handle, let's just call it merge conflicts? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so. It's not quite like a git rebase. In a git rebase, it's really regenerating the top layers, just gets handling that underneath. In this, we're just swapping out one layer on the registry. So the top layers don't get touched, their IDs don't change, they're all content addressed. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, how do you handle merge conflicts is an interesting question. And the, the idea is uh, if you 
sort of construct your layers so that they don't conflict, uh, then they just apply naturally on top of each other. Uh, so part of the difference between the Docker file model and the build pack model, this new v3 build pack model, is that in Docker files, you can kind of do whatever you want in each layer. In this, they're restricted to directories so that they all apply cleanly, essentially. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah, that's interesting. So in general, we make the build packs provide the dependencies in a way so that they don't need the same directory, right? We, uh, there's a little, like each build pack gets a sandbox directory that has like a POSIX style root in it with a bin and a lib and all of that. So they're all kind of isolated. And then we set up the environment to string all those together, if that makes sense. Uh, we've been thinking about some interesting things we could do with operating system packages to let us kind of take advantage of the same layer rebasing, but that gets, gets pretty complicated. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? You're asking about Knative and build packs? Yeah. So uh, currently, we have a a build template in the Knative official build templates repo for the Cloud Foundry build packs, and that works right now. It's the same v2 stuff, just kind of we have a shim layer that makes v2 kind of behave like, like v3. It gets some of those features to work on top of uh, registries and with, with OCI images. Uh, there's a PR in there right now for full v3 support uh, that should hopefully get merged soon. You can check out that PR. I think it, it works. We're just, just some wording details that need to get worked out. And that, that uses Knative's build CRD, which is like a, a part, the part of Knative that does builds. So that if you use those templates with it, you can use that to build apps on that platform. Cool. Cool. Any more questions? Last one. <laughs> Uh, so Heroku started a build pack registry uh, that um, they've kind of talked about uh, making a more open community related thing. I don't think they've, they're ready to announce anything quite yet. Uh, but yes, we, we are looking to create a big uh, community repository build packs and with nice integrations that would let you easily pull down the build packs you want to use um, instead of kind of confining them to a list of build packs on each particular platform. Um, that's, that's definitely part of the plan. <laughs> Uh, sorry, can you say again? When do we have an? Uh, yeah, so uh, we're currently converting the Node.js build pack to v3, and we're going to provide a wrapper to make that work on Cloud Foundry too. Um, the, uh, you know, I think say that'll be done in a couple weeks probably. Uh, uh, the Java team has been working on uh, splitting the Java build pack into a, a bunch of different v3 build packs too. Um, they've made a lot of progress on there. They have some parts that, that you know work really well now. Um, the, so that's, that's when the build packs will be, you know, the Cloud Foundry build packs will work on v3. You know, the other part of that question is, when will Cloud Foundry run the v3 build packs, right? Uh, we, we think we can get that wrapper done pretty soon, but we don't have a timeline for what, you know, native support might look like yet. Ah, uh, so I, I didn't hear all of that. <laughs> uh, you're asking about build pack versioning uh, and how that plays into detection. Um, can, can you, uh, it was a question about you have an application and you have multiple build packs of different versions in the same list and you know which one gets selected. Uh, okay, so uh, the V3 API, the new CNCF API supports uh, versioning and so you can have uh, you can sort of construct your, it's, it's now a two by two list of build packs because you have build pack groups and then you have candidate groups. Um, it, 
uh, it, it supports versioning so that inside of one of those groups, you can say, always pull the latest version or pull a particular version, and you don't have to list the same. You wouldn't, like, it wouldn't really, you wouldn't really have the option of listing the same build pack at a different version multiple times. Or if you could, but it would be, it would be obvious that you're doing something you, you shouldn't do, <laughs> if that makes sense. You could have different candidate groups that have different versions of the build pack in it um, if you wanted to, though. Does that sort of make sense? Does that answer your question? Cool. All right. Cool. Anything else? I think we're just out of time here. So uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, feel free to grab us afterwards if you have questions. <laughs> <laughs>